In 1989, it was John Halverson's time to shine. If he could do that, dancing through the raindrops. Halverson setting a course record and taking home the title. In 1990, blue sky, sunshine, great conditions, and Leslie Lahane would make the most of it. It would be Lahane crossing the finish line first, taking home the female championship in 1990. In 1991, Mother Nature plays a cruel trick on the masses. Talk about your frozen tundra. In 92, clear, crisp, and very much on the cool side. In 93, more of the same, setting the stage for this year's race. Blue skies and not quite sunshine. We're still working on that, but great conditions nonetheless for the 17th annual Tulsa Run. Hi, everybody. I'm John Walls, along with Catherine Switzer and Doug Welch. We welcome you to this year's broadcast of what should be an outstanding athletic event. I talk about the weather conditions because in years past, Catherine, that has been a major story here. Rain, hail, sleet, snow. Kind of sounds like the post office creed a little bit, but we do have great weather today, and that should set up a very nice tone for the race. Indeed, John, and it's not only the weather that's perfect, but the field, the talent is unbelievable. In the 17-year history of this race, I have never seen a field this deep. It's featuring, of course, the great Kenyans. They're all here. There are probably 10 guys who could break John Halverson's 4309 record. So it's not the matter of if it's going to be broken today, in my view. It's a matter by how much and by how many. Let's mention a few. Godfrey Kiprichich, Stephen Yambu. Mubarak Hussein, and of course, our, one of our favorites, the American Todd Williams, is going to have his work cut out for him today. Todd Williams finishing second in this race last year to Luke Swartboy. Swartboy is not back to defend his title, but in the women's race, Lynn Jennings, Doug Welch, is back. And she says, I want to win that championship one more time. That's right. Last year's champ, Lynn Jennings, is back to defend her title. Should be strongly challenged by Delilah Asiago of Kenya as well as Laura McIntosh of Florida. Uh, Laura running very well, won Falmouth this fall, a very strong women's field. I don't know if the course record of 48-14 is in jeopardy, but still a very strong women's field. And we also have the Masters Division's runners, too. Joseph Enzal, two-time Open champ in this race, is here in the Masters Division, meaning that he's over 40 years old. Also, Jane Hutchison, last year's champ, is back, too. When you look at this field in general, we talk about the number of people participating in the Tulsa Run. That's really what makes this event so special. We have more than 8,000 entrants in the fun run and in the 15-kilometer. Well, the fun run is just a moment or two away from getting started. Let's see as the youngsters of Tulsa hit the streets in this year's Tulsa Fun Run. The 17th annual Tulsa Run is being brought to you by Runner's World and the Tulsa World. Where in the world can you find a way to empty out your garage by filling it up with people? In the World Classifieds, where you'll reach thousands of garage sale shoppers. Because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Where in the world can you find out about cowboys and Indians, touchbacks and razorbacks, slams and rams, sooners and laters? Every day in the world's expanded sports section. Because nothing covers more of your world than your world. No two feet are the same, and Runner's World doesn't just sell running shoes. The trained salespeople at Runner's World take the time to learn about your feet before recommending a running shoe. Every member of the staff at Runner's World is a runner. They know that choosing the right shoe for your feet will help you reach your running goals without injury. Runner's World stocks over 100 types of shoes for a variety of running styles and forms. Whether you're a pronator or a supinator, Runner's World has the shoe suited to your specific stride. If your feet just don't feel right when you're running, the experts at Runner's World can help you get to the source of the problem. Why leave the choice of the most important piece of running equipment to amateurs? Don't let the wrong running shoes stop you in your tracks. Whether you're running 5Ks or marathons, the experienced staff at Runner's World can help make you fast and keep you injury free. Runner's World, your personal resource for running shoes, is proud to be a sponsor of this year's Tulsa Run. Welcome back. John Walls here with Doug Welsh and Catherine Switzer. And the fun run is now underway as the, the youngsters really beat the pack off the start line here in a hurry. Two miles ahead of them, the fun run numbering in 4,000 as far as participation is concerned, Catherine. And the key there again is participation. It really is, and I'm, I'm delighted to see these kinds of numbers, especially with these young kids, because they get a sense of 
fitness as fun. You know, a lot of people think of running as punishment, like in the army and stuff. You in PE, we always have to run for punishment. And now these kids are learning that it's fun and it's a great way to be fit in an easy, fast, and cheap way. You also see so many parents out there as well, Doug, and I think that's what has been nice about this race as it has evolved over the years. The fun run I'm talking about is they've really tapped into that opportunity to get out and participate with your children, with your schoolmates, and, or maybe with your teammates of a particular athletic team of some type. That's right, John. It's really become a family affair, the fun run has, and many runners run the two mile and then graduate on into the 15 kilometer event once they get a, a touch older. And you know, we're talking about families running together. One thing we have to mention is Debbie Marshall and her 16-year-old son, Mike, are out there someplace running together. Well, really in celebration and in memory and dedication to their uh, husband and father, Charlie Marshall, who died last year on the finish line of the 15K race. And they also want to thank the Tulsa Run people for everything they've done to make that experience as, as positive as possible. Yeah, tragic event it was indeed but as you said a positive experience is the result and it is nice to have the marshals out participating this year as it is all the children here this is our new feature quad cam the finish line all four shoots at the finish line and as we progress through the race of the 15 kilometer race we're going to put the four shoots up on the screen break it down there to give all you at home who participated today maybe friends family neighbors whatever a chance to see all the finishers or as many as we can and again quad cam coming to you doug was that your idea no, I wish I thought of that, John, actually. Uh, but, you know, one of the great things about a day like today, the beautiful weather, is it allows the school kids to, to get involved. Many times the bad weather keeps them away from races, and we've got ideal conditions today. And here go the wheelchairs. And what an interesting race this has become. There are only six entrants this year, but thanks to Kaiser Rehab Center here, they beefed up the competition level. They brought in two other uh, really good wheelchair runners, and that is Char uh, Chad Guzman from Palm Springs and Don Dowling from St. Louis from the St. Louis Wheelchair Athletic Association. They're going to go head-to-head -to -head today with Jan Matter and the great wheelchair runner from uh, Arlington, Texas. And Jan's out ahead early with the uh, two runners in red, Chad and Don, on his heels. And the one in the white helmet is Don Dowling from St. Louis. You saw there the two lead wheelchairs as the second place chair slips in behind Don Dowling and Jan Matter there going back and forth one, two. And drafting very much allowed in the wheelchair competition, Catherine. Yes. You're allowed to duck in behind that leader and let him do some of the hard work for you. Well, John, I often say that it's very, very much like uh, bicycle racing. These drafting is very important. And watch, you'll see them switch here. And look, he's looking over. He's going to now... Um, that's Don Dowling slipping in front of Jan Mattern to uh, share the drafting and the uh, pacing responsibilities. And as they go south on Boulder Avenue, they reach speeds up to 25 miles an hour as they descend the hill. You can see now uh, Chad Guzman from Palm Springs in, the, in third, right behind them. That's Jan Mattern on the right, now in the front with the green shirt. You can't say enough about the tremendous upper body strength of these competitors, especially the gentleman you see here on the screen they are of national caliber, in some cases world-class caliber wheelchair racing, and to be able to go 15 kilometers at this pace is really tremendous. Well, and of course it's become a highly scientific sport now, and these chairs run about $2,500, and they're all custom-made. Um, the two guys in the red shirts uh, represent even a team. They represent the Shadow Quickie Racing Team and bike manufacturers. This is a first as far as the Tulsa run is concerned. Race walkers going off the start on their own actually they started just moments after the 15 kilometer race but we wanted to give them their moment in the sun as well as the race walking population has certainly increased by leaps and bounds doug if i can kind of cross metaphors there <laughs> that's right and uh, michael hairston the pied piper of race walking in this town has developed race walking from its infamous infamacy up to uh, a field here of about 50 race walkers and Evil Mahedic of Overland Park, Kansas, probably the class of this field with Hairston on his heels right now and Jim McFadden also in the field. Coming up, the 15-kilometer race as we continue our look at this year's Tulsa Run. No two feet are the same, and Runner's World doesn't just sell running shoes. The trained salespeople at Runner's World take the time to learn about your feet before recommending a running shoe. Every member of the staff at Runner's World is a runner. They know that choosing the right shoe for your feet will help you reach your running goals without injury. Runner's World stocks over 100 types of shoes for a variety of running styles and forms. Whether you're a pronator or a supinator, Runner's World has the shoe suited to your specific stride. If your feet just don't feel right when you're running, the experts at Runner's World can help you get to the source of the problem. 
Why leave the choice of the most important piece of running equipment to amateurs? Don't let the wrong running shoes stop you in your tracks. Whether you're running 5Ks or marathons, the experienced staff at Runner's World can help make you fast and keep you injury free. Runner's World, your personal resource for running shoes, is proud to be a sponsor of this year's Tulsa Run. Where in the world can you find a way to empty out your garage by filling it up with people? In the World Classifieds, where you'll reach thousands of garage sale shoppers, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Where in the world can you find out about cowboys and Indians, touchbacks and razorbacks, slams and rams, sooners and laters? Every day in the world's expanded sports section, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. We're back and ready to roll in the 15-kilometer Tulsa run. Our starter this morning, Tulsa Mayor Susan Savage, firing the opening shot. And they're off and going through the streets of downtown Tulsa. The start of the race always kind of a hectic moment if you're one of the competitors. And you have to watch for somebody's feet in front of you. That's why I think those elites, Doug, have the advantage because they don't have to worry about the masses behind. They sure don't. They're off to a quick start. Really never look back for the masses. They really don't worry about them. And as you mentioned, mentioned Mayor Savage there, she's an avid runner. And we're blessed as a city to have many of our city leaders as runners. And, and that can do wonders for a city. And, and it really has done wonders for the Tulsa Run to have that kind of leadership. A look there at some of the 4,000 plus participants taking to the streets. And of course, these steps are always the most fun to take because they're your first ones. It's the problem is when you come back up Boston Avenue there at the finish, uh, finish of the race and you know that the legs are a little bit heavier. You have to remember that 15 Ks, 9.3 miles, is really beyond fitness. I mean, people who do this have really had to go out and train hard for this. Um, you, even though some people are just running this once a year, it's going to require a number of days a week of training. So many different training groups around Tulsa, in fact, all over it. Green Country in Bartlesville and Tahlequah and Muskogee. Different speed groups that have, have gotten together for maybe the past 10 to 12 weeks and have worked together. The long runs, the Tulsa run, training runs down on the river. That's right. On uh, Sunday morning, so much goes into this with the various corporations around town who have participated and led the training runs. So the Tulsa Running Club, one of those as well. And how about the group of old timers? There's 55 guys here um, who have run every one of the 17 Tulsa runs. There's a look at the 212th Field Artillery Brigade from Fort Sill, Oklahoma, participating as usual. Nice to have the fellows and young lady back participating. More on her. More on her later. later. But they've been here every year except for the year of the Gulf War. That's the only one they've missed. Understandably so. You know, Doug, the start of the race, it is so difficult not to go out too fast. And I see so many somewhat inexperienced runners or novice runners head on downhill because the first two to two and a half kilometers of the race is for the most part a downhill run that's right they're by far the easiest two kilometers of the race and and my advice to many runners in, in pre-race talks has always been to under race the first half of the race make the corner at the halfway point and then really begin your racing and here we view the leaders right now and there's godfrey kiprotich number seven taking the lead and you talk about going out too fast it's unbelievable how fast these guys go um, they're going to be running close to a 438 mile pace here. That's the course record pace, and these are the guys that are capable of doing it. And for most of these people running here who are fit, who have trained, a 438 mile pace for 9.3 miles is just inconceivable. That's something you drive. It is something you drive, <laughs> and you drive very quickly. And, and in as great a shape as Doug and I are, we would be hard-pressed to stay with these guys for half a mile. That's right. You see the leaders now starting to weed out away from the field a bit. On the right part of the screen, that is Stanley Kimitai wearing the number 30. Mm -hmm. Number 7 in the middle, as Doug said, Godfrey Kippertish, our leader. And then off of his shoulder is number 3, Rolando Vera. And here we come back to the 212th Field Artillery Brigade. And let us say that there are 124 men and one woman. And the one woman is Sergeant Renee Preston. And she is the pacer for the group. Take that, guys. Uh, they have to. <laughs> <laughs> Kipper Titch really stretching out a, a nice little lead here, three or four meters over Vera. Uh, but, you know, this is so early that, that really it, it's hard to to really say this is much of a definitive move. Very often, nothing really happens in the Tulsa run as far as major moves until about five kilometers. So we're going to see a lot of jockeying around and see a lot of the um, 
a, a lot of the elite athletes in this pack right now. I see Ruben Reyna back there in the black and white striped shirt, uh, uh, Travis Walters, uh, a number of the elite field that you're seeing right now. I think one thing you can say definitively though, Doug, and I think you'll agree with this, is that the Kenyans are always fast starters, and we have uh, three or four really good Kenyans right there at the beginning, and they don't mess around. You no, know? they have moved right to the front. Uh, one thing they don't want to do is let the pace uh, uh, lag a little bit. They want to keep the pace hot. Absolutely, and they're, you know, it's interesting. They're a group of really nice guys. They're always happy for each other's success, and they, they will really try to set this race up so that if any of them win, they're happy. As you long see, as the Kenyans. <laughs> Laura McIntock there, the uh, current leader of the female race, but that's actually Lynn Jennings wearing the number one bib, the first time in the history of this race that a female has worn number one. I didn't know that, but certainly Lynn Jennings on the right in the red uh, low-cut shorts is well-deserving. I mean, there's a woman who is, what, eight times national cross-country champion and world cross-country champion several times over. On the left, though, let's talk real quickly about this woman, Laura Mikatok. What a Zephyr-like rise to fame. She has won a number of road races back-to-back, -back, week after week in the United States. She's uh, originally from Detroit and has been training in Florida, a former University of Florida runner. Back to the lead men. And that guy in the front, number 30, tall and lanky, that's Stanley K Kimutai, also, of course, from Kenya, and uh, well-known for racing all over the United States and uh, Europe. Catherine, I'm kind of curious. I know how it feels to be a back of the packer, but as far as the elite are concerned, do they have that butterfly feeling? Does the first part portion of the race, is it used as, let's get my legs under me? Is that the theory here as we see Delilah Asiago? Yeah, let me just interrupt to say that, that this is Delilah Asiago, who is now running in third place, right in front on the right. See the guy in the blue? That's Joe Enzal one of our top masters runners, and he uh, was the former winner of this race, right, Doug? Two-time former winner. And the only guy who's won this race twice. Right. And we'll talk more about Delilah Asiago in just a moment. Do they have butterflies? Let me get back to your question. Everybody before a race gets butterflies, and I often, they say, why am I so nervous? Why am I so nervous? They say, you won't be nervous as soon as the gun goes off. You weren't nervous today, were you, John, as soon as the gun went off? I was petrified. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to get trampled in the mess, so you have to run. <laughs> right, Nate, now they've made the curve from Boulder Avenue off of Boulder Park and uh, looks like they're heading, headed towards Riverside Drive now. So uh, the, the downhill sections have uh, begun to flatten out now. Well, I'm really happy to see some Americans really pacing it with the Kenyans on the right. Let's talk about Travis Walters from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. He graduated from uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute in Virginia and has now been really training hard in Florida and really wants to make it on the American road racing scene. So you gotta hand it to somebody like Travis to go out with these really, really class guys. Right, and like Travis Walters, Brian Baker, a recent uh, University of Arkansas graduate, uh, All-American at, at Arkansas NCAA champion. Is that uh, him, 34, in the middle right, class? That's right, that was yeah. Brian. We see Jeff Lindsay, Gary Madison, one of the top Masters runners here in the Tulsa area. Mike Wilmering, a uh, Tulsa Running Club executive there comes board Brooks, member. Brooks Queen, an ultra marathoner in the Tulsa area. John Manis, number 4057. And here comes uh, Marla Stewart on the right, wearing the MoCo, uh, her employer's shirt. That's great. There's Steve Haig from the Bartlesville area coming through. These are still well under an hour type runners, probably in the upper 50 minutes to an hour elapsed time at the finish I projected. Also, yeah, and I also saw Doug, Doug Thurston in there and Michelle Byrne. Doug Thurston. See, I, I, I tried to get on the course there, Doug, in the van. They just, they just decided that John's going to have to get out and run, and so run we did. Ted Jacobs going by. Ted, former director of the Field of Dreams, run a very successful five-kilometer race here in the Tulsa area. Looking at this, it's, it's hard to imagine how many, these guys are running so fast that there's this many people who are this good. We see Bob Hennig going by. Bob of Runner's World, one of the sponsors of this program and a proponent of running here in the area. Does a great job as we go back to the lead pack. And again, it is Godfrey Kipritish, number seven, in the lead. A long way to go, though, and he does have, as you see, a lot of company there. They, they'll keep each other company for the better part of this race, Catherine. As you said, they, they'll, they'll take turns back and forth taking the lead and exchanging the lead. Well, but yeah. they'll be a pack for the most part together here until about the eight-mile mark. Well, one thing that impresses me uh, about the Kenyans here is that they seem to be treating everybody fairly equally. You know, the Kenyans often have run as a team and tried to simply 
really run hard and push everybody else out of the way, but they seem now to be running a more Americanized style, which is sort of to, to well, not help each other out, but sort of run in a way where everybody has a really equal chance. Again, we take a look at the masses as they come down Boulder Avenue through Boulder Park, making their way out to Riverside Drive. John Lai, a fine local triathlete there in the middle of the pack. I say middle of the pack. John's going to finish right around one hour if his training pays off. And as we see, again, Godfrey Tippertish. Look at the uh, 21st Street Bridge there. Gives you an idea of how far down Riverside Drive they are. They're approaching 31st Street right now, but this have to go about another two and a half miles before the turnaround. Really good shot there of uh, number 34, Brian Baker. Um, you know, I, again, I can't say enough about the fact that some of these guys who are essentially over their heads on paper are, are here trying to foot it with these faster people. Also, another person that is really good uh, runner and always here at Tulsa, Ruben Reyna, right tucked in the middle of the pack in the black and white right shirt. Up. Ruben, Olympian, uh, Barcelona in 5,000 meters. Doug, is there a price to pay, though, for trying to hang with the big dog, so to speak, with with going out at this kind of pace if you're not accustomed to it? There really is. Uh, it, once once the decision is made to go, you've got to go and go all the way. If you don't, you'll fall right out the backside of the pack and be eaten up by the rest of the approaching runners behind you because they'll gobble you up really quickly. But let me hasten to add, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I mean, exactly. I have seen uh, John Ngugi fall in the Commonwealth Games. He, if there was ever a gold medal, it was John Ngugi and uh, uh, Lloyd from Australia picked up and beat him. I mean, you never know who could fall or crash or uh, overextend themselves. So, you you know, if you, if you try for it, you get the feeling of what it's like and go for it. For those of you who run in the Tulsa community, you'll recognize the overpass there on 31st Street as they make their way a little further south. Again, the turnaround is 53rd Street, just past Interstate 44, where it crosses over Riverside Drive. And so, again, they're in that two-mile range or so to go before the turnaround, but the lead pack still very much intact. Moving up alongside of Godfrey. Godfrey, of course, number seven in the blue shorts is right on the right, number 88, Jonah Koetch. Jonah is... Um uh, Doug, former Iowa runner? Former, former Iowa, State, Iowa State, Big 8 champ and NCAA champ five times. Catherine, we saw Roland Vera there take the water and not drink it, but pour it on his head. Is that an indication that he's a little warm out there right now? Is this uh, per perhaps uh, some testimony to his conditioning or, or perhaps how he's feeling the effect? Well, it's, it's really interesting because the day is a cool day and, and there isn't much of a headwind. And it was interesting that Roland, of that whole group, was the only one who, who took water. He didn't drink it. He threw it on his head. I frankly think they're running really too fast to be drinking much water because it seems to me at this pace they're going to be um, chance of getting cramps quite easily. I mean, the pace is fast, isn't it, Doug? It really is. And, and they went through the first couple of kilometers right in the 250 to 252 pace per kilometer. And it is unusual to see a lead pack runner take water early in the race, especially a race 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. Now, if this was a marathon, I could understand it, but it is unusual to see that. Interesting people just going by. I saw Bill George, Tom Bauer, Frank Purdy. It was Terry Comier. And you're seeing many of the runners with the corporate logos, the team logos, the school logos. And there's a whole competition in that. There's a corporate competition based on uh, age-graded scoring and participation. There are, there are open teams, which is based purely on performance, on cumulative times. And there's school teams, which is based on participation. I've got to admit, too, as far as the school teams is concerned, my partiality lies toward Darnaby Elementary out in the Union District, and because they had more than 100 participants sign up, I've got to sumo wrestle the gym teacher there <laughs> in a week or so Darnaby in one of those inflatable suits. But we had almost 300 people sign up to do the race this year. Back to the lead pack again. That's Kipper Tish maintaining the pace. Doug Welch, where do you think Todd Williams is, the American favorite? I don't see him in this group. I don't see Todd at all. Todd, Todd wearing all blue today, and, and gosh, I don't see him at, at the back of the pack at all. You know, this, I, ha I hasten to add that this front pack is very, very good. The second pack is excellent. I can see back there Mark Plaches. I can see Sean Dolman. I can see some really outstanding runs. Wait, wait, do you see off to the left? I saw just the blonde hair. I think of Todd Williams. Flash of blue. Flash of blue, maybe heading up the beginning of that second pack while we go back to the other runners. Gosh, these guys look good. They're really running great. And again, they're cold, coming off of Boulder Park right onto the river. So they're, they're just now hitting the river as the runners leading the race are headed probably towards 41st Street by now. 
And I saw Kay Olmeyer go by, John Sheehan, Roger Slagle. There's Marilyn Thompson. Monica Defee. You gotta like the smiling faces there and the waves. Everybody's still feeling so good about themselves, and that's great to see. Yeah, they've just come off the easiest part of the course, so things are still pretty good in, in the runners' minds right now. I don't think it'll be until about the halfway point. And there's our race director, Sue Neal, and Chester Caggio was very much close to her. Chester with uh, Quick Trip and Sue Neal, the race director. Oh, yeah, and her first race at being 60 years of age. She is so proud of that, and she was a grandmother this week. Just became a grandma. Got the big double this week. Directing the race of this magnitude is just a an enormous task the first time Sue's taken that on and uh, I saw her about 10 minutes before the start of the race I said what are you doing she said I'm warming up and I'm going there's nothing I could do now I'm gonna have fun and enjoy the next hour hour and 20 minutes an so. excellent thing for a race director to do because at that point there should be nothing else you can do you should get in your own race if you can and find out where the problems are in the back of the pack well here is the front of the pack and no problems here but look at the separation Doug from the this first pack now to that second group it looks like there, there might be a surge thrown in there. It looks like 12 to 15 runners still in the lead pack, but there is 40 to 50 yards before the next group of runners. And a very talented group. I mean, you've got a world marathon champ Mark Platt just in the second group. Yes, but do you see who's off the back of the front group now? Todd Williams, the American, has moved up. You know, Todd Williams no, doesn't run very many road races, and, and he chooses Tulsa because it helps set him up for the uh, cross-country championships coming up, and he never comes here unless he's fit. So it's interesting that he's playing a canny game at this point. And Todd really has become a favorite of Tulsa running fans. He's been here several times now, been out kicked twice and won once. So uh, he has become a favorite of Tulsa. I think sound is best on that one. Just let it play. And you know who's joining the uh, 212th is McLean High School. Uh, has started a junior ROTC program, and there are 26 young cadets here running alongside of those guys, headed up by retired Lieutenant Colonel Arnie Peterman. So congratulations to all those young cadets from McLean High School. I just Great saw uh, Catherine Livingston, local physical therapist, who has gotten me many a, through many a run as far as physical therapy is concerned. Unfortunately, I could talk about injuries, but uh, good to see her out today as well. Here we go. We're still headed out south on Riverside, heading towards the I-44 underpass. Uh, um, really still a large pack of runners. Uh, Godfrey Kiprotich still at the front. He's doing a lot of work today. You notice, too, that he is in, has been in the lead for the most part throughout the early portion of the race here, Catherine. And you, you, if you look at that seesawing back and forth, they're making Godfrey go out and do all the work. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but right at that moment, Godfrey is really pushing the pace. He's surging right now. Look at this. He's opening up a little bit of distance between him and this pack. He's really going to make them work for it. And the pace is taking its toll. I just saw Travis Walters, number 28 from Florida, on the right, way back in the red shorts. He has fallen off the pace. Well, good for Travis to stay with it that long. But just as Travis has fallen back, Todd Williams has made his way from the back pack to the middle of the front pack. And there he is very much in the race now. Yes, and Sean Dolman also, the Irish runner from Bowling Green, Kentucky, is off the back of this pack too. Just hanging in there, the tall blonde guy. And back about though. Maybe two and a half miles or so, three miles back. You see the. You see the body what's, type what's change. Left? <laughs> Just saw Joe Cristiano wearing a Halloween mask. Well, uh, and, and with all due respect, they are participating. They're out here and they're taking part in the event and they have planned for this event. I'm talking about everyone who's out here for the past year, for the most part. In, in many ways, it, the back of the Packers, it's a harder race than the front guys. These guys do it for a living. Is Godfrey perhaps testing the reserve of the folks here in this lead pack? Does he want to find out who's seriously in the game today? Is that why the surge, Catherine? I think Godfrey's trying to do two things. I think Godfrey, A, is trying to win the race, and he's trying to make it hurt for everybody else while he's doing it, and I think he wants a course record here. And he's running like a champ. I mean, he's, look at this. Now he's he's just, just a beautiful runner. He's just daring them to follow, and, and everybody's willing to, to go in the chase right now. The course record, 43.09, set by John Halverson back in 1989. So some five years later, the course record is still intact. Yep, and that's a 438 per mile pace, folks. And if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen today because this is still, it's cool, it's overcast, and uh, they've got the field to push it. And, and Godfrey now looks like he's doing all the work. He really does. 
Let's identify some of these guys again. On the left, Godfrey Kipricic in the front, and the tall man, Stanley Kimutai, in the blue, wearing um, uh, the, it's Todd Williams, number two. On the right, number 88, is Jonah Koetch. That's Jan Mattern, uh, our leader in the wheelchair. And he's heading back towards Boulder Park, so he's very nearly close to the eight-mile mark. And he's broken the draft to the other two. More importantly, he's all, all by himself. All on his own. Should we identify some more of these people, Doug? Well, number 11 there in the middle of the screen, just off the shoulder of Kimitai, that's Mubarak Hussein, another outstanding Kenyan. And what an interesting story he is. He's the younger brother of the famous Ibrahim Hussein, who we all know is a many-time winner of the Boston and New York City Marathon. Mubarak was here in Tulsa last year for the Cherry Street Mile, where he ran 3.52 to finish third, so uh -oh. he's got a great turn of speed. Don't be near him at the finish That's line. That's right. <laughs> Look out. He now looks they, beautiful. They spread out across the road from Godfrey Kiprotich on the left to Rolando Vera on the right and Todd Williams right in the center in the all blue number two. And there's a runner on the far right. All on, That's Koetch, isn't it? That's uh, Jonah Koetch, number 88, arms and arms and uh, twirling. And I can't help but mention the fact that he is a walking political advertisement today. The Dave McCurdy for Senate campaign has enlisted his efforts and you might notice the bumper sticker there <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> or, uh, he is a walking bill or running billboard today for uh, Dave McCurdy. I don't know if Jim Inhofe is demanding fair time, but uh, perhaps in, in the sense of fair play, there should be somebody back there with an Inhofe uh, sign as well. And On the far left, if you look at 42, that's another one of our sort of unknown Kenyans, Stephen Nyam Nyamu. This is one of his first races in the United States. He's raced a lot in Italy. Niamu, just 22 years old, participating as captain said in the first 15 kilometer race of this year. Todd Williams now starting to come to the forefront. Todd, an interesting story, as you know, Doug, as they approach the turnaround. He was a high school football player and a wide receiver and led his team throughout their running exercises and found out that, hey, I'm pretty good at running. And so it was the football team's loss, but the cross country team's game when he gave up football and took up running in high school. That's right, uh, uh, ran and played in, in Michigan and then went on to the University of Tennessee where he was an All-American, an NCAA cross country champ. And here they are approaching the halfway, which is at the turn. And it looks like they're on course record pace to me, 21, 20 or so, right when they turn. Oh, they have to really slow down for this. Wow. Sean Dolman in the blue shorts struggling to keep up with this pace and look at that turnaround we lost about three guys and including Ruben Reyna, Sean Dolman and did we lose Brian Baker? What is the sense if there is one here Captain of desperation if you are one who has fallen off the pace I mean just a matter of five six seven eight maybe ten yards do you have that sense of urgency perhaps that if you don't get back in a hurry you're a forgotten entity yes because um, it really if you can stick with the pack it makes it so much either easier both psychologically and to a certain extent physically because they are breaking some of the wind and you are taking sharing energy and momentum etc 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 but let me hasten to add these guys are are running aren't they Doug they're running a, a course record pace they're running a record pace so once you're off the back of this pack uh, catching up is going to be very difficult doing it by yourself as the pack moves with with collective power and talking about collective power let me just say look at Todd Williams now he is powering through and let remember that he came up from a second pack to the first pack and that required an enormous amount of effort because these guys are pretty much running as fast as they can run and so he had to really put on a lot of steam to do this and they're approaching the 8k mark now and, and it looks like they're gonna they're still running 250 to 252 pace they're running very very steady that is very fast Rolando Vera is still there. Oh, now he's moved off to the left, the, the short little guy. Uh, boy, what a tiger he is from Quito, Ecuador. Like the Kenyans, he's born and bred at altitude. And uh, I'm going to interrupt just a second because I think we probably have some. That was one of our first masters. Here comes a lot of our local runners, Trevor Fieldson, John Birmingham, Ronnie Parks. John Birmingham looks like he's leading the masters division because he was in that group of younger runners there. Again, a master is anyone who is 40 years of age or older. You're not quite there yet, Doug. No, I'm working my way there, John. <laughs> Quickly. 
And boy, the pack has really broken up a lot now. It was it was 11 guys just before the turn, and now it's five or six with Williams and Mbarak Hussein really pushing the pace there on the left-hand side. Here comes our first female. This is Delilah Asiago starting to make the turn. You see Delilah here at 23.51. And then Asiago, and then off of her shoulder, as you said, Catherine. Lynn Jennings coming around this. And I must say, Lynn, um, I think is suffering a bit from the effects of a long layoff this year. She took off some time this year to kind of rest and recoup, work on base training. It doesn't look, quite look as the sprightly strong Lynn Jennings of last year, but I know she is really just beginning her peaking up for the cross-country season. But they hit the halfway mark at 24 minutes, so they're well above record pace as well. So maybe part of the reason she looks like that is because it's taking the effects on her. But Lynn, a, a champion in every sense of the word. But that was a very good move for Delilah, as we see Laura Mikatok, who was the early leader, because Delilah is usually a very fast starter. So she obviously waited to come through and, um, and, and pass them in later stages of the race here. That is Mubarak Hussein, who has the lead, wearing the number 11 off of his left shoulder on the right of the screen. That's Godfrey Hippertish, and then to the left, again, wearing that number three, that is Rolando Vera. And Todd road Williams off of his shoulder. Todd, as Doug had said earlier, was a 1992 winner of the Tulsa Run. Finished second here last year, but loves to come back here and certainly like nothing more than to spoil the Kenyan strategy here and come up with a first place finish today. And on the far left, number 42, Stephen Yamu. He's hanging in there. You know, it'd be interesting to see what <clears throat> Todd's tactics are because Todd, having been here three times before and out kicked twice. Now we're, we're getting towards the the last 5k of the race will Todd make a move and try to take the sting out of somebody's kick or will he be content to sit back and take his chances this is a healthy group of Tulsans Steve Jennings Jeff Lindsay and Mike Wilmering was in that group as well was he not there goes Mike yes. Wilmering and Bill Robinson and our and Lorraine Mahler New Zealand Olympian in the marathon yeah she was leading that pack in the black shorts and right in there also was um, Jody Hawkins from Texas who's just now moved to Monterey California and your leading master runner from Oklahoma was there right Gary Madison was in that group and, and this is really a thrilling spot as you're racing back towards downtown the runners who are still on their way out south you know, you're, you're running right past them, and the cheers really, really does a lot for the runners as they're heading back towards downtown. They're, they're yelling at them constantly, clapping their hands and cheering them on. Number 2137, the first gentleman there making the turn, Rick Bryan, as he is well under the one-hour pace as well. All right, and this is one of our wheelchair finishers, and as he has a white helmet and a red shirt, that is going to be... That's Don Dowling, and he finished, that is not Jan Mattern. Let me correct this. It is not Jan Mattern, the winner. Jan was the winner of the race, but that was a picture of Don Dowling from St. Louis who finished third in the wheelchairs. And there goes Vera again with the water. He is, he has done that several times now, and none of the other leaders have taken water the entire distance. Todd Williams looks so relaxed out front right now, Captain, for someone, as you said, who had to expend Perhaps a little extra energy to get out of that second pack and get up to the lead group here. He's an amazingly strong runner, and you're right. He looks phenomenal here. But I also must say that, that Godfrey on the right, who's been doing the pacing and surging up to this point at least, also looks good. And Mubarak Hussein on the left is a picture of perfection in terms of tranquility and control. I'm curious about Rolando back in there, and I'm curious about Steven Yambu, because they kind of look like they're, they're struggling, hanging on, arms and legs everywhere. And, and Rolando, as I, I was telling the story before and didn't finish, he has been hanging in road racing for years. And, Talk and, about durable. And he's had a very long season this year. Well, Stephen Yambu off on the right there with his head tilted to one side right behind Godfrey. Um, no stranger to road racing, apparently, having raced very well on the roads with the uh, Italians, who are tough, tough road racers. But he, this is getting to be one of his first tastes of uh, American road racing. And it's interesting, of these five runners, Niamu is the only runner who has not led a single step. They've all seemed to move to the front and taken their turn at the lead, although Godfrey Kipritich has surely done his share of the work today. But Todd and Barak Hussein and Rolando Vera have all moved to the front, but uh, um, Stephen has been content to sit back there and let the others do the work. Well, look at Todd. I mean, he just looks beautiful. This is really phenomenally strong running. I, if I were to pick a winner right now, it'd have to be Todd Williams, but we know that he had better watch it in the finishing straight because these guys are fast. 
Again, he's up against Mubarak Hussein, who is a, a pretty good miler. I think we're going to see some action in the hills. Well, the hills, as many of the elite will say, Sean Dolman, I talked to before the uh, competition, said it begins at about the eight-mile mark, the race he was talking about, because that's when that climb, about three-quarters of a mile up Boulder Avenue, really separates the champion from the uh, also rams and as you get up that hill and you hit that climb you must dig down deep because there's very little gas left in the tank at that point of the race well i think that that's something that todd williams is a specialist that is digging down deep he's a strength runner he's really tough he's wonderful across country he also ran the hood to coast relay on that uh, long relay team did right. really really well in that and um i think that if he paces as well and, and runs hard through the hills you know, he has a really, really good shot at this, but I wouldn't leave it till late. And again, they're still on record pace. They're running still in the 250 to 252 per kilometer pace, and uh, they went through nine kilometers at 25.38, so still on record pace. So they're still under a 43.08 pace, is what you're yeah, saying. right. And, you know, John Halverson set that record virtually as a solo effort, so with this group effect uh, and, and being on record pace, I'm, I'd like to think that the record's going to go today. Do you think it's going to be a matter of a great amount? Well, I think it's a matter of uh, how many people. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I marvel at here, when you look back at Todd Williams and his running history, Doug, never been injured, never missed a workout. Now, what does that say about, A, his resiliency from a chemistry makeup for the, the gift of the body that he has, and of his dedication and discipline to running. Well, I think dedication, discipline, and long-term planning for success. Todd, I don't think, is really worried about success, short-run successes. He's, he's, he's very much concerned about the world scene, the world championships, the Olympics. So those are long-range goals. So he trains for those and doesn't get excited about the stuff in between. It, we're very fortunate that he chooses to come to Tulsa once a year. And think about this, too, Catherine. As we're watching the leaders come in, they're nearing the turn, and they're, they're at about so probably in that 12 and a half kilometer range in there, or 12 kilometers, somewhere in that vicinity. They're still passing people who are coming in. I mean, that, yeah. who are going out, rather. Yeah. They're coming in, and they're very close to the finish in relative terms, while there are many who are still going out. Well, that's what I was saying. It's very hard for the average runner to really realize how fast this is. They are going very, very fast. The 438 mile is just in incredibly fast, and most of us couldn't stay with them for a quarter of a mile or a half of a mile. And in fact, I think they're going as fast as they can go. And when I'm talking about um, is there going to be a moment when they're going to break away, it's going to be a very, very exciting finish because I think all of them are hauling it right now just as fast as they can haul. They're at about at the 11-kilometer mark now. You saw the pace car there as they approach 31 minutes, and uh, well, you see the 4K mark going out on the course. But to give you an idea of what kind of speed they're going, if you are to go to your local high school track and one, run one lap of the track, if you could run it in a 70 seconds, 68 to 70 seconds. If you could do that one time, they're doing it about 40 times in a row without stopping. Phenomenally conditioned athletes. Oops, there's you a see little, a little stumble there in the back. That does happen from time to time. And you gotta realize this is not a non-contact sport. Yeah. There's going to be a little pushing and shoving, certainly not to a great degree, but there will be contact. And particularly uh, to separate yourselves when the pack may be a little more crowded than this. There might be an elbow or two going in there. Of course, the famous incident we remember from the Olympics in Zola Bud. That's right. And they're approaching the 12K mark, but just to give an idea how fast they run, because everybody's run a 10K, they went through the 10K split at 28.30. Oh, my gosh. So these guys are really moving. Look at the separation between them and the next runner. It's a couple hundred yards. Yeah, and they, any one of these guys would also be pretty happy with a 28.30, depending on the conditions for a 10K race. So they're obviously running all out. Now you can also look at this, two things. They've separated themselves from the rest of the field. They're out of sight from the rest of the field. And now they're beginning to run the tangents. They're looking to save every inch, every second that they possibly can on this course. I couldn't help but notice the matching shorts of the race walkers there off to their right. We had three ladies all with matching kind of aqua colored shorts there, Kath. I'm pretty impressed by the well, uniform. Well, you, talk about the, you talk about women's clothing. I'll talk about how fast <laughs> the men are. And I know, John, that's a goal for you of matching clothing. <laughs> hey, look, I want to talk a little bit about number 42, Stephen Yamu. Uh, um, I, you know, he's the one guy in here we haven't talked a whole lot about. Yeah, and that's because we don't know much about him. He's uh, not run. This is his first major race in the United States. As I say, he's uh, very young. He's going to be 23 uh, on November 20th. He's a family man. He's got two kids. 
and we talked about how important it is for the kenyans to do well and earn money because they've got to take it back to their families and in fact many times these people support a whole village he had some family problems and couldn't get out of kenya and run much at all last year and the previous year though he conducted himself in very very well in the italian road racing scene and ran very well there but he has some incredible times including um, a 10,000 meters run in 28-29 at altitude. And when I saw 28-29 at altitude, I thought, this guy could do something out here today. Well, and also uh, knowing that he's a member, of, uh, a former member of the Kenyan World Champion Cross Country Team. I mean, Two times. Yeah, remember. just to make that team, you know, it would be all NBA if you were playing basketball in America. Doug and I were talking earlier, John, and we said that there's probably 100 men in Kenya who could run 10,000 meters faster than 28 minutes. So to make the uh, national cross-country team and to make it twice is an outstanding accomplishment. He was sixth in the World Cross-Country Championships back in 1991, finished seventh in the same competition in 1992. Again, that's cross-country. Road racing, though, the difference there, Catherine, when you hit the pavement as opposed to running cross-country? Well, it, it's a difference in, in your technique and a difference in what you prefer. Todd Williams, for instance, prefers cross-country, and I think that requires a, a lot more strength of a different kind. However, road racing requires more resilience. And there goes Godfrey Kiprotich again. He just moved the pace up a notch and spread the field out again. And, and here we are late in the race and heading toward Boulder Park, getting off of Riverside. And uh, Godfrey just moved the pace up a notch. Boy. And they just don't stay on their side of the road either. They run the tangents, as it is called. They run the straightest line they can throughout the course. Again, Delilah Asiago there, as you see, splitting the two gentlemen there. Yeah, I mean, she is with a very, very good company here. Here's some of the invited runners, in fact, from Mexico right in front of her. And she is flying along. She's averaging about 5.15. Uh, no, about 516 per, per mile pace. Right, and I just saw Lynn Jennings off her heels, probably be about 50 to 60 yards back. How difficult is it, Catherine, for a runner, a female runner in this case, Delilah Asiago, who is, for the most part, running on her own as far as her competition is concerned, whereas we see the contrast of the men's race. There are five there in the lead pack. They know exactly who has what, or at least who is where, and... Are, they're very well aware of what they have done to that point, where now you have Delilah, who really has no idea where Lynn Jennings is. She knows where she is. <laughs> <laughs> she'll hear the crowd roar uh, 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 just about the point when Lynn goes by, and she'll hear people calling Lynn. And Delilah has some good company here. She's running with 1078, and that's James Duval from Bartlesville. And these people, um, these guys are, are, are queuing off her a little bit because they know that she's going for a very good pace. And that's, that's helping her a lot. So she's really not out there as alone as it seems. In fact, there's a little controversy in terms of women's running. Is it helpful to have men right. who are around you who are probably faster and, and help pull you along? As far as setting pace and, yeah. and helping you, and carrying helping you, you along, a little sure, bit. sure. And here they come off the river and onto Boulder Park again, and there's the, the bagpipers. And Rolando Vera took water for the third time in this race just now, and, and he's moved to the back of the pack, and we're approaching the the Boulder Hills right here. There's a series of a couple of rolling hills, each a couple of hundred meters long. Well, I think this has got to, it's got to be Todd Williams' moment. If he's going to start making his move, I think he's got to make it here. And just as it was, it is his moment, I think that that was very poorly judged of Rolando to take water there. Maybe he had to, but yeah. on a curve, on a hill, he's off the back of the pack already, and he's going to have a very, very hard time making that up. Well, since they've moved the race course from Houston Hill to Boulder Hill, almost each year the race has been decided on the Boulder Hills. Again, Delilah Asiago, and then you see, oh, maybe 100, 150 yards back, Len Jennings struggling to keep up the pace as Asiago continues to pound away at the pavement. There's Delilah. Well, well she looks like she's struggling back there, but as Doug said, they're running a very, very fast pace, and Lynn is the consummate champion, and um, she's running very well. She's strong. She's, she's a powerful woman. And one thing I'm very, very happy about Lynn Jennings is she has disproved the old myth that you have to be super thin to be a top woman runner. She's uh, powerful and strong, and it shows. How difficult is it at this portion of the race when you know you have about a mile or so left to go to have to all of a sudden change the elevation? You've been running flatlands for about five and a half to six miles, and now you've got to shift gears literally and stick it in overdrive and have to climb that hill, Doug. Well, in this stage of the race, it's very difficult. Had the hills been early in the race, it wouldn't have been much of a big deal. But it was downhill at the, at the start of the race, and now it's uphill. And it is because you've been in a stride pattern for five to six miles where every stride was much the same. And with no wind today, it was, you had little resistance. And then you hit the hill, and you've got a lot of resistance. 
And there's uh, Tim Owens running with uh, with our lead woman, uh, Delilah Asiago. And that's Tyson Ishell, 1838, right behind her as well. But th there's a face of calm, and uh, if there's a perfect running form, there it is. Uh, height weight ratio, she's tiny young woman, um, perfect arm carry. She's not even opening her mouth yet. And Delilah's really a pioneer. Very, very few African women have made it out into the international scene. And, and I kind of like to think that, that uh, Catherine, she's a lot like you as far as one of the, the pace setters of her sport in her country. And she is leading the women of Kenya. Thanks for saying that, Doug, but it, it, it is very hard for a woman of Kenya to break the social and cultural barriers. You know, at 16, it's time for them to start getting married and thinking about having a family. So for her to get away in her early 20s like this and to run and earn money internationally by herself is real hard and real important. Right, and most of these runners, these Kenyan runners, uh, men and women both, are generally from the countryside rather than city folk. So generally, they live their life in a very organic diet, a very clean altitude uh, environment, uh, a, a, a lot of walking and running, and not a lot of riding in the car. That's right. Well, we're down to four, fellas. Uh, Rolando is gone. He seems to be off this group. And Todd Williams is still there. Doug, what do you think? I mean, I, I think at a certain point, Doug is just, uh, uh, Todd's just going to have to move. Oh, I know. It, it's, it's just a matter of when, because uh, he, he's been out kicked twice before, and, and Todd's a classy runner, and I, I know that he probably doesn't want to fall into that trap again so i kind of keep waiting for him to take a surge out here towards about the 13th kilometer or so but well, again uh, you know godfrey kiprotich is just unshakable well and also mark hussein with that he's that fast mile time um, nobody in this group has that kind of mile time i wouldn't want to be anywhere near him and then we revert back to the relative serenity of delilah asiago's stroll down riverside drive it appears she is so much under control in her stride looking exceptionally strong here with about two kilometers to go. It, it's very interesting to me that a Kenyan woman runs the same way as a Kenyan man, which is real calm and in perfect form. Okay, very it's, relaxed. it's getting hot now. And here they've moved off of Boulder onto 10th Street and they're heading straight towards Boston Avenue and they're heading towards the turn where Junior, Tulsa Junior College sits at the corner of 10th and Boston. And it looks like it really has heated up. Vera falling off the back completely. And now we're back to Delilah Asiago, who's coming off of Riverside and heading towards Boulder Park. The stretch drive for the men, well, for all the racers for that matter, but for the men, it'll be, oh, about a quarter of a mile, perhaps a little under that, once they'll make that final turn down Boston Avenue, down the long straightaway. You see the church at the end of the street. And here we come down the home stretch. That's Boston Avenue Methodist, of course, lurking there in the background. But it is the final stretch drive. And you know you're home because you can hear that PA announcer. You can see the finish line. And they have a lot of company digging in. But you know who can win this year's race, Doug. That's a longer kick than you might think. Sometimes when you've got a, 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 a long stretch to the finish and you can see the finish line from a long ways out like that, it's very important not to launch your kick too early. But they've started kicking now. They sure have, and look, it's Godfrey Kiprotich who's been kicking the whole way, is still out there in front. It's not looking good for Todd Williams. Now Todd has moved back to fourth position, and now it looks like it's up to uh, Mubarak Hussein, Kiprotich, and Stephen Nyamu to kick towards the tape. And there they go. And they're still on record pace. Oh, they're flying. Very much on record pace. In fact, they'd all have to fall down now. Oh, look what's happening. It. It's Mabar Hussein on the left, and it is Stephen Yamu. It is Stephen Yamu who has taken the lead, and they've dusted off Godfrey Kiprotich. Todd Williams in fourth place. Vera way back in fifth. Stephen Yamu. Yamu has not led it the, the race the entire way until the last hundred yards. Now he bolts to the front, and it looks like he's going to take Mubar Hussein. Hussein cannot answer the surge of Steven Niamu, and with the finish line well within his grasp, Niamu will cross. Does he set the record? You betcha he does. 42.51 for Steven Niamu. Mubarak Hussein three seconds off his pace. Todd Williams in as well. And in Godfrey. fourth place, and Godfrey Kipertis you saw in third place, six seconds off the pace. Here comes Rolando Vera, he lagged off the lead pack there in the final two kilometers of the race, but he will finish, as you see, well ahead of the 
sixth place finisher. And in fifth, what a gutsy performance from Rolanda. The first four guys broke the course record. And the 43 minute barrier is now history in Tulsa. They're under 43 minutes. The time is 42.51, 42.54, 42.57. Todd Williams also breaking the course record. As Catherine said, the top four finishers shatter the Tulsa run record and Delilah Asiago on her way to the female championship as well. Where in the world can you find a way to empty out your garage by filling it up with people? In the World Classifieds, where you'll reach thousands of garage sale shoppers because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Where in the world can you find out about cowboys and Indians, touchbacks and razorbacks, slams and rams, sooners and laters? Every day in the world's expanded sports section because nothing covers more of your world than your world. No two feet are the same, and Runner's World doesn't just sell running shoes. The trained salespeople at Runner's World take the time to learn about your feet before recommending a running shoe. Every member of the staff at Runner's World is a runner. They know that choosing the right shoe for your feet will help you reach your running goals without injury. Runner's World stocks over 100 types of shoes for a variety of running styles and forms. Whether you're a pronator or a supinator, Runner's World has the shoe suited to your specific stride. If your feet just don't feel right when you're running, the experts at Runner's World can help you get to the source of the problem. Why leave the choice of the most important piece of running equipment to amateurs? Don't let the wrong running shoe stop you in your tracks. Whether you're running 5Ks or marathons, the experienced staff at Runner's World can help make you fast and keep you injury free. Runner's World, your personal resource for running shoes, is proud to be a sponsor of this year's Tulsa Run. Welcome back to our coverage of the 17th Annual Tulsa Run. I'm John Walls, along with Catherine Switzer and Doug Welsh. You just saw Stephen Yamu win the men's race. We still have the female champion to crown, and it looks as though Delilah Asiago is going to be the champion. As you see Delilah on the right portion of your screen there, back by the motorcycle policeman as they escort her to the finish line. And she's running fabulously well, but it's not going to be a course record. The course record was set in 1988 by New Zealander Ann Hannum. It was 48-14. But Delilah Asiago striking a blow for the women's movement out of Kenya. Fabulous. A victory here. She's raced wonderfully well in the United States in many races. She's had a, a real comp competition season with Lynn Jennings. Um, but the victory today goes to Delilah Asiago. And doesn't she look fantastic? Just wonderful performance here. Doesn't look like it's hurting her one bit. Almost went through the uh, wrong shoot there. Now we go through the, the proper uh, finish line as she breaks the tape. And then Lynn Jennings is going to finish second. Lynn, again, to the far right of your screen. There's last year's defending champion. Isn't able to come up with the title two consecutive years, but still a fine performance here today. Yeah, Delilah's time, 48.57, and it looks like Lynn is uh, uh, about 50 or 60 yards back from, from her performance. L Lynn is running very, very well also here today. She's always sorry she doesn't win because she is one of the toughest competitors out there, a wonderful role model to American women. She's run for a number of years, and she knows how to pace herself and choose her competitions carefully. One of her most important competitions is coming up, and that's going to be, again, the National Cross Country Championship, which is going to set her up for hopefully another title at the World Cross Country Championship. But let's watch the great Lynn Jennings finish now in second place as she comes into the women's shoot in a time of 49.57. Third and fourth place still to be decided. And this one's a bit of a race. Laura Makatak there leading on the left side of your screen. On the right side, that is Jody Hawkins, who is trying to close the gap, but it appears to be Makatak who is going to finish in the third place spot and Jody Hawkins in fourth. And a great performance from Micah Talk, a really tall woman, almost six feet tall, powerfully strong, but boy, she has to be a little bit tired because she has raced almost every weekend this year. Jody her, Hawkins for fourth. Her time 50-23, Jody Hawkins in 50-29. Catherine now is joined by Stephen Yamu, the men's champion. I'm with our winner, Stephen Yamu from Kenya, who led an incredible finish, a four men across that finish line in course records, all of them. Stephen, if you describe to me the sensation when you came around the corner at the finish line stretch, 
you, Godfrey, Todd, and Mubarak were together, and you were racing to the finish. What what were you thinking? Describe that to us at that time. Uh, I was I was not afraid of them because uh, I knew the Yakik, uh, the person I was uh, thinking he can uh, beat me. Uh, at the kick is the American because I have never been learning with him before. Uh, this is my uh, I think first la uh, first race since I came from Kenya. Uh, so it's okay for me. I'm I'm happy to win. I'd say it was okay for him. How about the women's finishers? Delilah Asiago, 48-57. A minute behind was when Jennings and Makatak there at 50-23. But again, our women's champion, Delilah Asiago. She's now with Catherine. And we're with the women's winner, Delilah Asiago from Kenya. Delilah, congratulations. A wonderful race. But you upset a very famous American champion, Lynn Jennings. Tell us about how the race went. Anyway, the, the race went on smoothly, you see, from the starting, we, we started, me and Lynn James and Lowland, then after that, they went, they went ahead of me, all the way, they have been leading, two of them, they were been leading almost 3K, then after that, Lynn Jing took over until 5K, after, they, after she leads 5K, I, I started to took over easy, easy, I've been lead, leading all the way up to the finishing. It was an easy day, the Kenyan connection coming up big, the second place male runner was Mubarak Hussein, and Catherine now had the opportunity to speak with Mubarak after his fine effort here in Tulsa today. We're with second place finisher Mubarak Hussein. Mubarak, great race today. You broke the course record also. Um, but Godfrey did all the pace work. Um, tell me about how that went out there. Yeah, it was, it was, I felt bad for him, but we were trying to keep up with him. The pace was so high, and I guess he was so strong, he took the lead almost from start to the finish. But you all looked like you were going as fast as you could go anyway. It didn't look like you could really help him too much. Yeah, we tried, but we were keeping up with him. It was so, he was going at a very high speed. Three Kenyans and one tough lady from New Market, New Hampshire. Lynn Jennings, the runner-up in the female race. Catherine? And I'm with second place finisher now, Lynn Jennings. And Lynn, I don't mean to be negative. Congratulations on second place, but second isn't normally where you finish. Are you disappointed? I'm really not because I've had a good fall um, after a very low-key year so far this year. And Delilah did run a, run a very strong race today. Well, it has been a low-key year. What, what's the reason for that? Well, we just finished a nine-month um, project, and no, it's not a baby, it was a house, and um, it tended to take quite a bit of time and energy. But I've had a good fall, and now I'm making the transition over to cross-country. Well, that's always been your speciality, um, and how many times are you going to go for it again this year? Uh, well, let's see, this is number eight in a row, nine overall. So I ran a cross-country race last week, and I'm all fired up. Great, that's really wonderful. Let's get back to this race today. At what point did Delilah take over the race, and, and what were you feeling at that point? Well, Laura Mikatak took it out hard, as she usually does, but um, she was gone by the 5K mark, and I went through 5K in 1539, and then Delilah snuck up um, and took the lead and just powered away and really got quite a commanding lead. I went through 10K in about 32.24 or so, but Delilah had about a 100-meter lead. So it was Lynn Jennings, the defending women's champion, finishing second to Delilah Asiago, Stephen Niamu, our overall champion. Well, the... Best of the rest. We got a lot of race still to come as the Tulsa run continues to wind its way to the finish line. More on that when we come back. No two feet are the same, and Runner's World doesn't just sell running shoes. The trained salespeople at Runner's World take the time to learn about your feet before recommending a running shoe. Every member of the staff at Runner's World is a runner. They know that choosing the right shoe for your feet will help you reach your running goals without injury. Runner's World stocks over 100 types of shoes for a variety of running styles and forms. Whether you're a pronator or a supinator, Runner's World has the shoe suited to your specific stride. If your feet just don't feel right when you're running, the experts at Runner's World can help you get to the source of the problem. Why leave the choice of the most important piece of running equipment to amateurs? Don't let the wrong running shoe stop you in your track. Whether you're running 5Ks or marathons, the experienced staff at Runner's World can help make you fast and keep you injury-free. Runner's World, your personal resource for running shoes, 
is proud to be a sponsor of this year's Tulsa Run. Where in the world can you find a way to empty out your garage by filling it up with people? In the World Classifieds, where you'll reach thousands of garage sale shoppers, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Where in the world can you find out about cowboys and Indians, touchbacks and razorbacks, slams and rams, sooners and laters? Every day in the world's expanded sports section, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Welcome back to the home stretch of our coverage of the Tulsa Run. Just like many of the racers, though, out on the course, we got a long ways to go as well. This is the stretch drive, the home stretch. As you make your way up Boston Avenue down toward the finish line, I'm John Walls along with Captain Switzer and Doug Welch. And again, we're going to be bringing to you our own, the exclusive quad cam. And all four shoots will be videotaped and we'll have an opportunity there. You see us take a look at that. That A is the uh, female shoot. So if you came through shoot A, the uh, first shoot uh, on the far left as you were on the course, that's your shoot. As you see down below at Kitty Corner D, that's the shoot to the far right as you were running the course. And then B and C are the two in the middle. If you came to those, you're on your own, Catherine. You got to remember where you were. But that gives you an idea as if, if you're running the race or if you have somebody perhaps in the room there, they're going to say, hey, I was in the second shoot over. Well, now you know to look at B or C. Got it. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense? That's right. And in about 55 minutes, we're looking at runners who've averaged about six minutes per mile. So we're still well within the top 100, 150 runners in this race. So we're still looking at some very good performances here. You've got to remember there are more than 4,000 runners participating in this race. And to say that you finished in the top 100, the top 200, or for that matter, the top 400, you are still in the upper 10%. Is that where you were, John? I, 400, no, I, 399? I, 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 you... I'm probably about 507 or something. But, uh, yeah. Had a great day out here today. Really enjoyed that to see some of the female finishers coming down the left chute. And that was Susie Hunt of Norman, one of the best runners in Oklahoma. And you can see the women. Oh, Marla yeah. Stewart looking fine. She is one of your top, she's probably the top Tulsa woman runner right now. Probably so. And the women are, are, are getting towards the right-hand side of the course to finish through their shoot number A. Marla's had a great fall. You continually see her name pop up in the Tulsa world on Sunday morning when they show the race results from the various competitions around the city and around the area. Marla Stewart's name pops up there a lot. That's right. She's got a great cheering section and her daughter Hillary Catherine and her husband Nathan. I em emphasize emphasis on the Catherine, Catherine there for some reason, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'm the ex officio Auntie Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking now at, at people like Marla who have full-time jobs, families, uh, lots and lots of responsibilities, and they still are running at about a six-minute mile pace. And that is incredible testimony to the fact that they have a lot of talent and are devoting a lot of time to training. Yeah, these are not casual runners by any stretch of the imagination. And for each of them who finishes in the men's case in less than 60 minutes, in the females' run less than 70 minutes, you receive the much coveted Tulsa Run mug. And if you don't think that people train and think about that mug throughout the dog days of August and on through September and into October, how treasured possession of that mug is, because the only way you can do it is to break 60 as a man or break 70 as a female. Unfortunately, I can say from personal experience that 60 and change won't cut it. You have to get to 60. I just saw Kathy Molotar Barton from Houston, Texas, finishing one of our top Masters runners. Kathy is one of the uh, members of the board of the Houston Marathon, and I met her when she was running in Brazil, and one was one of the first women runners in Brazil. Runner 107, that's Paul Corey coming down the home stretch. Paul, local Tulsa, running in the 30 to 34 age group. He doesn't mind me saying that. I hate to give the specific age. Some people, uh, Doug, you know, yeah. but... Uh, and that's number 76 finishing, Jose Santiago. And there goes Johnny Harris, former Oklahoma runner of the year, down in shoot number C, finishing just under 58.30. Just saw Steve Knuckles in shoot D go by. Steve works over at Runner's World in Tulsa, one of the sponsors of the program this evening. And again, quite an advocate when it comes to local running and their endeavors. I know they've sponsored the Tulsa Running Club this year, have made an effort in that direction. And 
that aid and assistance is certainly appreciated from Bob Hennig and Steve Knuckles and all the good folks over at Runner's World. And Runner's World is the defending open team title champion. Last year, Runner's World was uh, de defeated Norman Running Club and Circulo out of Mexico. But uh, Runner's World, the open team defending champions, and American Airlines, the defending corporate team champion. Last year in the schools division, which was based on participation, Jarman was number one, and they had 328 students. So uh, many of the runners in the fun run and some of the 15K represent the schools, and there are several schools with over 200 registered. You know, Doug, I hate to say this, but if you look down at the bottom of the screen, just to the left of the middle, a guy in purple shorts, I believe that's yours truly coming down the home stretch here, right around the one hour mark. Hot dog. I'm, I'm still looking, yeah. John. Well, <laughs> we, we just focused out of, we, we, we just left the shot there, but I, I can, uh, I can certainly appreciate those of you who came over so close because that's how I felt at this uh, particular juncture. Well, it's interesting to see the runners come up Boston Avenue because many of these runners didn't weren't running with this sort of style about a mile and a half ago. But once you make that turn off of 10th Street by Tulsa Junior College onto Boston Avenue for the long finish, everyone becomes a sprinter for those several hundred yards. You know, it's also amazing no matter how tired you are, you're, you're quite capable of turning off your watch. Is that you? Shoot B, and there you uh -oh. saw the assistance there. I had that little sinking feeling in the pit of the stomach, and that was uh, to the literal sense. Yeah, I saw them grabbing a bucket, John. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> well, John, they also know that this is no longer a live call on this race. Yeah, <laughs> yeah unfortunately, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> What's fun, too, to see is as we, we saw the uh, one of the, the runners come across there at 59.59, that look of elation on his face when he had broken that magical 60-minute mark. Right, and his look was just opposite of the guy who ran 60.01. In the purple shorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're rubbing it in. Yeah, because to every runner, there is a barrier. You know, they, everybody finds a plateau, and, and you run, and you train, and you try to break a certain time, and, and to every runner, there is that plateau there that becomes difficult to break. Tulsa Run, it seems to be the even numbers, like 60 minutes, 70 minutes, 80 minutes. They're very much barriers for the runners to break. Lorraine Muller uh, talked to me after the race. She was a bronze medalist of course in the marathon and uh, 92 olympics in barcelona and she came here today she's getting back into marathon shape she wants to compete in atlanta she said i want to break 52 minutes she told me last night and she ran 51 59 today wow. she was elated that's right. all she wanted to do is get under 52 because that puts her on mark for training well it also says a lot about lorraine Mahler's evaluation of her own fitness level so, and we had a perfect day obviously uh, 52 degrees slightly cloudy very very little wind but Lorraine being able to pinpoint what level she's at uh, it just goes to show what kind of runner she really is. Well, it also is very interesting because Lorraine Muller is going to turn 40, and we'll talk a lot about Masters runners uh, later on in, in this race, but every year the runners over 40 increase. And uh, there are about 40%, I believe, in this race that are over age 40, and they're getting better and better and better. And here's Lorraine going to turn 40 in June, and she wants to compete in Atlanta. Well, you know, just a few years ago, our age groups around here uh, kind of stopped at 60 and over. And then they went to 65 to 69, and now it's 70 and over. You know, we keep having to, to lengthen the divisions, and then pretty soon it'll be 70 to 74 and then 75 and over, and, and I anticipate that. Yeah, we saw Char Charlie Kime out there, age 70, out on the course, looking really great. I expect pretty soon we'll see him coming in here. The runner 144 coming in, that's Rob Darnell from... Chautauqua, Kansas. So they come from all over. Colorado, Texas, California, New Hampshire, Boston, yeah, New Zealand, well. New Zealand, <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. They get a Todd Williams. And again, these are just outstanding times to come through. Janet Matthews and Shude, a fine local runner. All those months of training are starting to pay off, you know, at uh, running up Boston is a thrilling experience, and, and after you, you've completed the race, the stories, the war stories begin, and it's, it's really a lot of fun to hang out down there amongst the runners and hear the, hear the stories of the, of the tales of the course, and here we have the hundreds of runners coming up Boston Avenue, and again, they're probably still well under 7 minutes, 7.20 pace, and they're coming across the line, probably more than 100 runners a minute are crossing the finish line right now, and, and that's... And this is, let me just interrupt. This is Stacy McQuarrie coming in, and you're right, Doug. I mean, they're they're breaking. Uh, they're running around 7:12 from a mile, and they're running fantastically fast. Look how many of them there are out there. 
And, and for this many people to cross the line, obviously, obviously you have to have a lot of volunteers working the finish line, working the course. Just to give you an idea, for this race alone, there are over 800 people helping out on this run. So for every 10 runners, there's a volunteer. And, and if you've never volunteered at a race, I highly recommend that you do it. It gives you an, a unique view of running from the inside out. And if you keep volunteering, they're going to make you race director, like Susie Hill, who said to me she had never actually directed a race, but she worked as a real stalwart of a volunteer for this race for years. Well, I can't think of many major races in the United States where you've got a 61-year-old grandmother as the race director, and that's a testament to Sue's organization skills and her, you know, she's a great people person and a great organizer. Julie Thomas finishing the uh, run just moments ago. Mary Heydrich, also a local Tulsa runner, was in about a minute and a half back. Mary with a great effort today. And again, for the females who are finishing in shoot A, in the upper left of the screen, anything under 70 minutes, that's one minute or one hour and 10 minutes, that gets you that mug. And so that is very much on their minds as they come down the home stretch here. Well, and everybody looks really good. You know, with the weather outstanding like it is this year, it's really given us good finishing conditions and when it gets hot and sunny you really start to see people kind of falling by the wayside towards the finish but everybody looks very good well, you know a couple years there i saw them falling by the wayside out of hypothermia out of out of cold uh usually you say well you know i can put up with the cold but it's when that biting wind comes in it really um really lowers the body temperature and can get into a dangerous situation particularly if they're not wearing enough clothing and, uh, and with the, the comfortable conditions, you know, that, that made it very favorable for the Kenyan athletes who really uh, will tell you that usually when it's very cold, they don't run very well. They're, they're what I would call warm weather athletes generally, and obviously they ran well today. Oh, the run two years ago. Actually, I guess the, the worst condition, three years back, when you think about it, when the ice storm came through, we saw just a glimpse of it, a piece of videotape from that run with the uh, wheelchair athletes competing <laughs> and the ice and the snow, that icy glaze that was on the ground. Just horrific conditions and it, was, it caught everyone by surprise because the day before, if I recall, it was about 55 degrees or so. It was a beautiful day and all of a sudden overnight, it just became an absolutely uh, arctic blast of air that came through. As everybody can appreciate, it's hard to catch the names of all these people as they finish those tasks, but we will try to do our best on some of these numbers. And these runners right here are running about 7 minutes and 10 seconds per mile. So we're probably still seeing runners that are in the top 750 or so. So we haven't even seen 1,000 runners yet. We've got 3,000 more to come across the finish line. I believe that was Lori Kirkland who finished just a few seconds ago. Laurie, one of the better local runners around town. Uh, the running movement in Tulsa is a, is a, is a great scene. There's, a, there's races every weekend. We've got a great club around here. Uh, you, can, you can travel any distance from Tulsa, anywhere from Tulsa, 30 miles, and hit, hit a race almost every weekend. It's really a great running scene in Oklahoma. Well, it's so popular that they just opened a running club downtown, haven't they, where you can train out of? Can you, what's the name That's of the right, club? That's right, Fifth Street Athletic Club downtown. That's very impressive for people who, who work out during the middle of the day, which is going to be very important now that we're going um, daylight saving time because it's going to be dark when most of us get out of work in the afternoon. So if you can, if you can uh, get out of your office in the middle of the day, have a place to change and to shower when you get through, you can get a very good workout done in an hour. It's uh, Colin Cummings and crew are working on that. I think Wesley Brown involved in that activity as well. And, and that'll be a real challenge for athletes, uh, say, next week, the week after. Now that we've lost an hour of daylight, the, the big goal, the big race is passed. Can you still mo maintain that momentum and, and, and keep training through the winter? Or do, you, or do you take a break and, and maybe put, put a couple of pounds on or slow down or something? This is, you know, the next couple of days will be kind of crucial for a lot of runners as to their running future. I can very easily take a break and put a couple of pounds on. Sure. <laughs> Do I have to be told? Yeah, but you know, if you can train through the winter and emerge in the spring, it is some of the most valuable base training you can do. Especially when it's cold and you've got all those clothes on, you're carrying extra weight, and, and your body is burning up enormous amount of calories just to stay warm. So you can emerge in the spring without really dieting or doing anything else, you can have, have lost a lot of weight and be in terrific shape and get ready to start doing some teaching. And speaking so. of carrying extra weight, there's actually two firemen today from Engine Company 2 that are running in full fire gear. They're wearing the helmet, the jacket. I don't think they're wearing the fire boots, but uh, 
probably 15 to 20 pounds of extra gear and they're running 15 kilometers. We saw runner 4095 Lydia Borges coming through. Again, Lydia, well-known master runner here in the area. Right, Lydia, an over 50 runner and generally is one of the top finishers in her age group. And you know, I, I really have to see, I'm an out-of-towner, so I'm really impressed when I see people like Bob and Bill Dungeon from the Dungeon Brothers Board who have put up a lot of personal money to uh, support the Masters movement in this town for this race and to, to support it with the age-graded scoring tables for the age group so that if you're over 45, over 50, 55, and 60, you can still win money in this race. And I think that's just terrific. And, and what's interesting about them as sponsors, I think Bob in particular, he is, and his brother's triathlon, but Bob, triathlete, Bob is an avid runner and is running in the race today and taking himself quite seriously in the Masters category. Oh, believe me, he does. Oh, I, and, and we and talked about the, uh, the triathlon background. They sponsor the Dungeness Brothers Triathlon, which has been a long-standing event here in the area. I know uh, that, from a personal standpoint, a well-orchestrated event. Kim Elliott and Larry Adot are working in that endeavor. 110, uh, the mark, and uh, my better half about ready to finish up the race here as well. Wife Cindy uh, finishing up the race. Here comes Cynthia at 11003. Sorry, hon. The Good. mug. I mean, she's a little upset about <laughs> the mug, I have to tell you. There goes the coffee. That's set. the first thing she said to me. I said, How do you finish? She said, I didn't get the mug. Well, John, she'll be able to grab yours, right? <laughs> uh, you know. but getting back to the Dungeons Brothers for a minute, uh, they also sponsor the Oklahoma Challenge, which is also a cash prize for the top five men and women finishers from the state of Oklahoma. And then your mug yes and and that's a great deal for for local guys who who aren't going to finish in the top 10 or 12 and get the overall prize money but still have a chance to get some money to keep their career you know keep their running careers moving and, and keep motivated you see now i as an out of town i didn't know that i only knew their sponsorship in terms of this race and i can just say that that the dungeons brothers putting uh money into this race brings runners from around the world my husband roger robinson has profited by this race is uh, from new zealand comes over and runs this race when he can get away and do it because he believes so much in that system. Those guys do a terrific job. Doug, you bring up prize money. There is money on the line here very much as far as the, the top runners are concerned. The male and female champions, in this case, Delilah Asiago and Steven Yamu, both bring home $5,000 from this race. Runner-up takes home $2,500, but there's a bit of a discrepancy from here on down, Catherine. The male third-place finisher receives $1,000. The female... 900 and then it kind of trickles on down like that uh, about a 100 dollars difference between the male and the female race I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on that well you know it's funny you know everybody says let's hear from Catherine because she's you know the the, the feminist and she's out there crashing well if the i barriers. said let's hear from doug you'd be mad at me and i would and, <laughs> and i was always out there fighting for equal prize money but look i believe fair is fair and if the depth of talent doesn't exist in the female race to equal the depth of talent in the men's race, you have to make the prize money dispersed equally. Now, I believe money should be out there uh, as, as equally as possible so we can create incentive. I think that's very important. But the fact of the matter is, is that the top six women, uh, women runners are extremely talented. The top 10 are very good. But there are probably 15 men equal to the top six, if you see, in, in the women's field. And I would love to see someday maybe these performances prorated uh, or, or graded so that uh, when you know how many runners come into a race that the prize money can be totally equally distributed in that way. Now let me, let me again add that the women's field in this race, you have to salute Wesley Brown for putting this field together, men and women, he's done an incredible job. The depth of talent in the women's field is deeper than I've ever seen it. In, in, the, in all the Tulsa runs. He's done a wonderful job with that, but still it's not equal to the depth of the men's field. Right, great field on both sides. The men, the top 12 were separated by two minutes, yet almost $5,000 separates them, whereas the, the, the women, the top 10 women, were separated by about five minutes. So there is that uh, the difference in separation. Big discrepancy there. And that's not to fault a recruiter um, or the sport, but it, it's, it's the age of women's running. It's relatively new still, it's developing, and that talent will come along. And look, if there's only one Kenyan woman runner, Delilah Asiago, just imagine when there are going to be 10 Kenyan women and 10 Mexican women and 10 Ecuadorian women. These are countries, you know, that socially and culturally have not encouraged women. And when the women begin coming out of those situations with the same altitude training, the culture, and the nutrition um, that the men have had, 
we're going to see amazing things happen in women's running. Yeah, too, when you think about it, when you look at the evolution of, of women's running, it is a, a relatively short history that the marathon has only been an accepted run, a distance for women, uh, in, in the recent running history, that for so long it was thought to be too difficult of a run Absolutely. for women. It, it, was not an, it was not an Olympic sport, and now we have outstanding Olympic marathoners. Name of Joe Benoit Samuelson, as far as the United States is concerned, Rosa Moda, uh, another name that pops into your head as far as uh, the marathon distance is concerned. Um, but the women, the top women are becoming more and more known, but that wasn't the case in, until not too long ago. Absolutely. Quick history is that well, I ran the Boston Marathon in 1967. I wasn't the first woman marathoner, but I was try the officials tried to throw me out of that race because I was wearing numbers in what he considered was a men's race. We broke down the barriers and we got equality in women's marathoning, but not until 1972, and still there were only six of us who could meet the men's qualifying standards in Boston. And it wasn't until 1981, with enormous amount of campaigning, legislating, and conducting races around the world for women, did we get the vote for the Women's Olympics, which didn't take place. The first Women's Olympic marathon didn't take place until 1984. And I talked to many of the runners who are out here today, uh, maybe they've been running for 10 years, and they had no idea that women's marathoning wasn't in existence until 1984. So when you look at the opportunity at a high level, Olympic level, that is only going to filter down uh, very, very slowly to countries like uh, Ethiopia and Kenya and Mexico uh, for, for women. But it's now happening in a very, very big way, and we're seeing tremendous breakthroughs well, in those countries. Excuse me. Back in 1972, when Frank Shorter won the marathon in Munich, I think the longest o women's Olympic distance was a half mile. You know, That's right, it was. And, and here we are today, now women have full marathon in the Olympics and world championships. So women have come a long way from this sport, whereas, you know, the men have had, you know, all the events to choose from for, for practically 100 years. And all the role models, and all the coaches, right. and, and all the mentoring situations. And so finally that's beginning to happen to women. I'm really looking forward to the day, especially here in America, when there are more women coaches. I don't know of any women coaches who have coached women at the Olympic level in long distance running yet. Well, and that brings up the point of the difference in training, Catherine, as far as males and females are concerned. I mean, a distance is a distance, you know, 10K or 15K regardless. But is there a difference, you think, in appreciating what a woman has to go through as opposed to a man? And can a woman coach, you think, perhaps better relate to female athletes more so than a male coach could? Uh, look, I think that everybody is different, and I think people relate to people differently. I would like to see more women coaches simply from the point of view is, uh, that I don't like women athletes just thinking that, that men know better or that, that men have to show them the way. I'd like to sh show that women also can take responsibility. Um, also, the fact that in terms of training levels, you know, I'd like women to think that, hey, look, maybe I can't run as fast, but I certainly can run as long. And the idea is for all of us to stretch ourselves to the furthest reaches of our potential. I think that's the, the one of the most important things. The other, the other thing that is very, very hard, though, and let's face it, it, it is still harder for a woman to be an athlete than a man to be an athlete because the reality of the situation is the woman still has the bulk of the housework and the childbearing responsibility. And, it, and if she is also working, which is in 48% of the case in the United States, um, that's, that's a tough load to carry. And that brings up another point uh, as far as barriers that have been broken. Uh, just a few years ago, once a woman got pregnant, her sporting career was over. And now we see that women are having children and coming back and running faster than they ever have. In fact, I found out that today's champion uh, is a mother, had a baby a year ago, and today she wins the Tulsa Run. It's now that's just, just amazing. amazing. It really is. In fact, you know, it's interesting that the Russians found this out many, many years ago. They found out that, that for whatever hormonal changes that take place after pregnancy, that, that there, are, there are a number of months or years there where you can really capitalize on that and run very, very well. And I think the most brilliant example of that was Ingrid Christensen, who was, you know, a ranked runner, but not a very famous runner. And then when she got pregnant and had a child, she set a world record within a year after giving birth. Well, I can speak uh, from personal experience. I. I've been lucky enough, Catherine, to run with a, a group of ladies over the past couple of years. And uh, Margot Hampshire, Gail Lamb, my wife Cindy, and Cheryl Baker, all mothers, all very devout athletes as well. And uh, to, to be amongst them and realize all that they go through, I mean, there, there's a, a quite a case to be made for discipline and the sacrifice that they make to maintain fitness. And yet they are saddled, if you will, with the responsibilities of, of the home 
and with children and really have uh, put together a great mixture. Linda Moore is finishing through shoe day there, as you see, another local Tulsa run. But those women are wonderful examples to their children. Those children grow up on the, uh, the aspect of sport being an equal thing for, for men and for women and realizing that fitness begins at home. Oh, and there's fun. no question. And I, absolutely, I love seeing the families out there running in the sun. We, we've got a we've got a seven year old at home just ran a 636 mile on the Cherry Street last weekend, so we're really tickled uh, about that. Uh, and a, a ten year old who ran very well as well. Let me just say one thing. I, I, I don't ever want to think that what I say about women is, is is this is unfair. Let me just say, in the sport of running, that men have been more than than equal to us. Men have bent over backwards to help women with our sport, with our equality. They helped us champion our officialness movement, they, they were totally equal with the prize money to begin with, and that and, and have always supported us and helped us. You certainly don't see that in in tennis, or you don't see that in women who want to play, let's say, basketball golf? or golf. Sure. And so I, my hat is off to male runners, and we women love you guys. <laughs> and the runners you see now are coming in at about 8.30 per mile pace, and this is really truly the middle of the pack runners, and again, this is where you're starting to see 100 runners a minute come across the finish line. But the middle of Packer generally runs around 8.30 to 8.40 pace. And when the winners crossed the finish line, these runners were on the outbound part of the course still at 40. No, excuse me, they were past the turnaround, but they were still at about 45th Street when our winners crossed the finish line. And there's still a great deal to be said here for the condition that these people are in because the run a mile at 8 minutes and 30 seconds takes, for one mile, takes a reasonable level of fitness to put it together mile after mile after mile, and in this case, 9.32 miles, you have to be in, in, in very good physical condition. And it is uh, by no means a uh, meager feat to get out here and cover this race at the pace at which these folks are. As you can see, the pride and, and just the stride as they come in is extremely strong in both respects, and all well-deservingly so. I mean, the, the work that these people put through, uh, put themselves through, uh, again, the, the sacrifice that they are called on to make in order to, to participate. Uh, we'd love to see them. I can speak as a member of the running community. It'd be great to see so many of these people carry it on throughout the year and go out and participate and support the local races. Because, Doug, as you mentioned earlier in the broadcast, on any given weekend, there is at least one and sometimes two races that you can participate in, say, from Wagoner, stretching to Muskogee, to Coweta, to Broken Arrow, and, of course, right here in Tulsa. But there are races well within a, a reasonable drive. I think the Wildflower Run in Bristol, another run, run, just an exceptional five-kilometer run that you can go out in. And while you may not want to uh, think that you can go out and run with the elite, well, you can certainly go out and be amongst your fellow runners and support the local running community. But you talk about effort. You know, you see a lot of effort here. These runners train probably one-third to half of what the elite runners do, and they're on the course twice as long. So there is a lot of energy being expended here. Well, they're probably putting, a, even though they're training half as much in terms of mileage, they're probably putting almost not as much time in, but they're putting a lot of time but in. But their percentage of effort in training is, is, is very close to being equal, I'm sure. Exactly, right. exactly. You know, talking about percentage of effort being equal, I had the great pleasure of meeting the executive editor of the Tulsa World yesterday, Bob Herring, and his controller at Tulsa World, Frank Hawkins. And I think that they have probably just finished, I think I saw them come through already. And again, conscientious sponsorship is just so fantastic. Those, those guys um, have put so much sponsorship into this race, and one reason why we don't have much advertising here is because they've taken over the bulk of, uh, of the sponsorship of this broadcast, I believe. There's been a lot of added exposure this year. It's been really wonderful. I, I don't know if anybody in this community doesn't know this event is happening today. You bring up the Tulsa world. A good friend of mine, John Klein, there has been doing a series of stories over the co course of the... Well, I guess past six to seven months or so, where... I've heard uh, about him halfway around the world. John uh, John got a little hefty, you might say. At one point, he tipped the scales at 340 pounds, and it was at that point that he decided, hey, I might want to start thinking about shaping up a little good, a bit. And John was a, an outstanding high school athlete, and so he's gone on a tremendous training regimen as we see the uh, the folks from Fort Sill making their way in. Go ahead, uh, Captain. Me, I'll, tell, I'll I finish up about John. I gotta talk about these guys. There's a juggler there who's wow. doing great too, but the 212 Field Artillery Brigade from Fort Sill, Oklahoma is coming in, and again, I can't stress the fact that I'm very proud of the pacer for this group, is the only woman among 124, a man, Sergeant Renee Preston. She is a bubette. <laughs> and apparently the men are known as Bubba. Bubba. And uh, I love the fact that the Bubette is the pacer for the group. And she said, 
If they want to go faster, I'll go faster. <laughs> <laughs> Let him try to catch That's me. right, because he's a very, very good runner. And, uh, and, you know, running in formation like this is really, really tough. And yet I understand that as soon as it's announced for the sign-up, that they fill the ranks and they're out there training at 5 o'clock every morning. You know, these guys are as much of the part of the Tulsa run as the elite racers are. They are really part of the tradition because this is a people's race. You know, 5% of the runners in this race or less will get trophies. And they're moving along, probably coming close to, I'd say, nine-minute pace. And here you've got over 120 runners or so running right in the nine-minute range. They're going to break down the finish line? <laughs> This might be the hard part. This is a finish line worker's nightmare. Oh, <laughs> All right, start clicking, guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> stay in line, right? Yeah, sure, yeah. we'll stay in line. Uh, and I mentioned this before, but the only interruption in their participation in the Tulsa run has been when they were at the Gulf War. And uh, I'd like to see those guys on my side. They look great. Oh, absolutely. The juggler, by the way, Keith Baker from Tulsa, uh, runs with Team Amico, the Amico Corporation. And I know a lot of people whose goal it is is just to beat Keith, beat in the race. They want to go for the juggler. <laughs> that is, coming from a guy who wears purple shorts, that's really pretty bad. Glad you said that, I waited a long time for that one. <laughs> the wind up and the pitch. <laughs> I had to wait for the army to finish. <laughs> uh, go back to your John Klein well, the John story. Klein, well, John, John's a great story because he sat down as again, we see a couple of friends here finishing up. John went on a, a very strict training regimen with Julie Vaught Pickens uh, doing his uh, exercise work. He had a dietitian helping him out as well. Wasn't he working out of Hillcrest? Working out of Hillcrest, the Lifestyle Center over there, and they really turned his life around. For the first three months, it was very discouraging for John because he was running a half block at a time oh and then God. having to walk and then go, went back into his home. And this was 10 months ago. And uh, his eating habits had to change almost overnight, went to a non-fat or a very low-fat diet, cut out meat entirely, for the first three months or so. And it wasn't until about the three or four month period that the weight started coming off in chunks, five pounds, six pounds, seven pounds. And uh, his running increased and he very diligently worked at it over the course of that 10 months, ran the distance on four occasions. He had run the nine miles leading up to it. So he knew he could finish, but yet finishing today, I'm sure, I haven't spoken with John, but I would think that if there was ever a triumph of the human spirit, it was certainly embodied in what once was the vast body of John Klein, but has melted down to 230 pounds. So from that one time where he stepped on the scales at 340, John has dropped 110 pounds, about 75 in the training itself. But he decided from a long way off that I've got to get my life back in order at age 40. And John's done that, and he says on his way now to maybe a chicken fried steak dinner on Monday, <laughs> and maybe a burger or two on Wednesday. But come Thursday, Thursday, he is right back to the training regimen and the routine. He wants to stay in shape and see how much further he can get toward that ideal weight that he has in his mind. Well, I understand that uh, because he took on this program, even though it sounds extreme, he took on it on very conscientiously with the people at Hillcrest helping him with the nutrition, balanced exercise, and, and, and spreading out the exercise into aerobics and weight training and swimming and running all... Their master was yeah, included in thing. that. Sure. So it's well-rounded stuff to avoid injury and to avoid, you know, depression and hunger and all this sort of stuff. And I understand that he's been such an inspiration that many people now have signed up for this program. I hear that's terrific. Well, I mean, if, you, if, if ever there was a testimony to before and after, it was John Klein. And I, I can remember being out of baseball games here, the local double-A baseball team. John's the official scorer out there. And John would, would be just... Oh, they're the firefighters. Oh, they're the firefighters, yeah, dressed up in full regimen here. All right. I'm not sure. candy. All right, tossing candy. That's a way to make friends in the crowd, isn't it, huh? Look at that. That is not easy. Man. So Congratulations, guys. The firefighters in town, too. All oh, so many of them band uh, together here, and that's what fire station number number two. Two of uh, those representatives were from, but there are firefighters all over the city. Well, one but firefighter, Ron Fagali, has never missed a Tulsa run. He's running all 17. Just saw my friend Steve Reynolds finishing up in shoot. He ran with his uh, good friend, Tanya Pitzer, today. Steve is a... Uh, Renowned triathlete, too, participated in the Tahiti Marathon almost by accident this past <laughs> summer. But about Klein, I mean, he would look at those nachos and drool. And just drool as fellas would bring in barbecue and nachos, and he'd break out his salad. And John would, you know, stay with Diet Pop, he'd have water. And John, I mean, I'm telling you, if ever he, there was a temptation, it would be at those baseball games that would stretch two and a half, three, three and a half hours, and he stuck to it. And one of the unique things about John's training was they didn't train him to lose weight. 
they trained him to achieve a certain percentage of body fat. The weight comes off naturally when you train for the right reason. And, and John, I, I'd hate to call him a poster child, but uh, you he, could, he, he wouldn't mind. <laughs> Uh, but he's certainly an example of what you can do when you set your mind to it. You know, I really, I, ho I hope a lot of women are listening to that because basically uh, one thing that concerns me about women's running is the fact that a lot of women think they have to be picked thin and they, they diet. You cannot diet like that at an elite level and run hard. And if you eat a proper diet, it gives you the nutrition and the energy to train hard. And if you can train hard, then the weight comes off. So it all works together. I but, the, but the minute you start starving yourself, you get tired and you start getting injured. We saw Michael Hairston, the uh, local race walking guru, finish the race at uh, right around 129, the pace of that, Doug, for the race. Uh, he walked about 935 oh. per mile. And that was Sue Neal just finishing. Our race director. Our race director. Eating, fact, as you said. Uh, sorry, Doug, go uh, ahead with your thoughts. No, well, I was going to say, we've seen now a couple of race walkers. I think I saw Evo Mahedic from Overland Park, Kansas, a Czechoslovakian native who uh, has come down and, and walked a couple of events for us here in the local area and seems to be a very dominant walker. So now we're starting to see the top couple of race walkers come in, and the race walkers have on the pink race tag, whereas the runners have on the white tag. I uh, just saw a runner 5837 coming across the smile of satisfaction belonging to Sandy Heimavon. Again, the race walker you talked about, Doug, but Catherine, to get back to the point you, you had brought up there, as far as diet's concerned, um, when I was preparing for a marathon earlier this year, along with my wife, Cindy, and we went on a, a diet of sorts, allowed to eat generous portions of food, but the difference was the type of food that we ate. Uh, low fat, uh, high fiber, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fish, a lot of chicken, a lot of rice and pastas in the afternoon, not in the evening. A lot depends on what time of day you eat as well and what you eat during the day. And so it's possible to eat generously and to eat, uh, you know, relatively good samples of food, but you don't have to go overboard. You don't have to starve yourself. You can go ahead and get in condition and, and do it the right way and treat yourself every once in a while. Absolutely. That's a very, very important point. And diet is really ineffective without exercise. Well, runner number 4690 coming across. I love to see the looks on their faces as they, as they finish into the shoot area. 4690 was Nancy Baruta from Tulsa. You know, it's really tough to talk about diet as runners pass by Tulsa's famous Nelson's Buffeteria, <laughs> you know, home with a oh, chicken that's, fried that's, steak. That's where John's <laughs> off to Monday for his chicken fried steak. Nelson's a Tulsa tradition on Boston Avenue for over 50 years. I imagine they have a little gravy on the side there, too. And just finishing before that was Denise Polderman, 21-21. One of the race walkers we saw earlier was Jim McFadden. Jim, a local uh, masters runner and race walker, also was a, a coach for many years and at one time was the modern pentathlon Olympic coach for the tiny country of Bahrain. And uh, unfortunately, they were... They you, were you are amazing. Yeah, uh, so Jim has been around the world and mainly it's his running that has taken him there. And that's, that's the neat thing about running. It can take you places. And I know Catherine has taken you all around the world, uh, you know, uh, uh, these Kenyan athletes are halfway across the world from their home, and running is, is, a, is a vehicle that can take you places and, and, and show you sites that you would never have seen before. And, I mean, I wound up marrying a New Zealand man. I mean, halfway around the world is literally the truth. We live in both countries, and it was running that brought us together. I often say, you know, running is probably the most important thing in my life because it's given me my health, it's given me my career, it's given me my travel, it's given me my religion, it's given me my husband. And it's something that the two of you can do together and that you can share, and that, uh, that that is so important as far as uh, establishing perhaps other activities. I mean, these days, everyone tends to go their own way. It may not be with a husband or a wife, with a spouse, but uh, so many friendships are struck over, are struck up over the course of a run. As Doug, you have talked about different training groups you have been involved with over the years, and it's just kind of fun, maybe even in, in a strange city, when you're out and about traveling on business, go down to a local running trail, and uh, people more often than that are more than happy to take you under the wing and show you the ropes and take you on a tour of the town, perhaps a running tour. Do it, your five or six mile workout. I mean, how many times have you been out oh, yeah. in a strange city oh, yeah. and the best way to see it's on foot and, and why not go ahead and throw on the sockings or whatever and take to the streets? Well, you know, back in June or, or late June, the Tulsa Run training sessions began on Sunday mornings about 6.45 in the morning. And even back then we had several hundred runners every Sunday morning. And then pretty soon the Wednesday evening 
track sessions began, and there was over 100, 150 runners running intervals every Wednesday night at the Cashel Hall track. And so people have been training in groups, and, and people form little satellite groups off those big training groups. And really, that's the beauty of those big groups, is to bring people together and to develop friendships to where you can find somebody who maybe lives in your neighborhood that you can train with on a daily basis, and then come together for the large workouts once or twice a week. The other thing is the kinds of friends you make. I mean, normally you make friends with your work. Who are we seeing? And there's mayor, our mayor. Susan Savage. Susan Savage. Number 5810 coming in. Susan, uh, well, I should call her, uh, her mayor, Ship. <laughs> you better. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but Susan is such an avid runner. I mean, she gets up early in the morning, down on Riverside Drive with friends of hers, takes along the family pet as well, has her dog out there with her. I'm talking about the wee hours of the morning, but always runs in good company and is an avid runner and a great supporter of the local running community. And again, we, we've talked about uh, Bob Herring at the Tulsa World. Here's our, our mayor out, uh, Dr. John Thompson the Tulsa Schools Superintendent out starting the fun run today. So many of our local dignitaries are involved in running and have a particular appreciation for that. I happen to think if they're out there running every day and they're getting healthy mentally, physically, and emotionally, knowing how important running is for me, for instance, to relieve stress and, and aggression and anxiety, it's very refreshing to know that some politicians are doing the same thing. I mean, I think I voted for Clinton because he runs, I swear. <laughs> well, you <laughs> know, notice he wears the watch, other, right? Not many other reasons. <laughs> and we've got an election coming up here very soon, and obviously there's some politicians running. When they say running for office, they, right. uh, some of them literally mean it, others in a figurative sense. That's right. Some managed just to get their stickers on Fast Runner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got to give uh, kudos to the McCurdy campaign for that uh, that foresight. And it's taking a, a page out of the Inhofe book from in the early 80s. Of course, then now you think of another uh, local politician, Steve Largent, used to run pass routes. Now he's running for office. So uh, it's everywhere, Doug. <laughs> That's right, John. And here they come up Boston Avenue. There's still, you know, you can tell we've seen a lot of finishers. Many folks. hundreds of runners still coming up Boston. We are digging deep down in here into our uh, repertoire. 4704, that is Marsha Ashelman, Ashelman, excuse me, from Oklahoma City. And 860 with Stephen Fillmore. We don't hear it now, but earlier in the race, you might have detected the public address announcer at the race itself. Those honors belong to Jack Wing, and there you hear a little tease of Jack underneath. That accent is Bostonian, folks, and to those who know Jack, it drives them crazy 364 days of the year. But on this day, when you make the turn from 10th to Boston, you can't wait to hear Jack bring you home. All right, folks, good job. Way to go. Come on, runners. You're looking good. You hear Jack sign off, and you can park his car anytime, huh? <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know of a running event in this area that you won't see Jack Wing at. He, he's at all of them. Jack involved uh, professionally his career out of American Airlines. They're a great supporter of local running events as well. American Airlines participates in the Corporate Challenge here. They have their own running team as well that takes part in different events, and they have several runners who have signed up here. Many of these people, this run is the culmination of a year of anticipation. They have looked forward to this race since late October of last year, perhaps. That might have been the only race that they did last year. Might be the only race they do this year. And again, we'd love to see you out at the various events over the course of the year. We have the Michael Houghton run coming up the Saturday before Thanksgiving. The Jinx Half Marathon as well. For those of you who 
finish this race in good shape, why not run four more miles? You can do it. Well, many runners uh, come off of Tulsa Run 15 kilometers and go on to a winter marathon. This is a great test to see what, what kind of marathon shape you might be in in a month or two. And there's still time to put in that, that November, December road race before you do that marathon. You know, I said earlier that this is beyond fitness, and it was interesting when I first began running. When I got to the point where I could do 9 and 10 miles, and the jump to 15 miles was very easy, and then the jump to a marathon was very easy. It was the first 3 or 4 miles that was very, very hard for me. So I would encourage people to go on and take these challenges. Another thing that is terrific is to, to next time you take your vacation, is to combine it with a race. Take a running vacation, see a different part of the world or a different state, and, and run and get to meet new friends and mix with people. Well, John, that's got to be encouraging to you with a marathon on your horizon. I've got that that's January coming up, uh, Houston. Oh, I thought it would be Walt Disney. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I think I'm going to be headed down in a different direction. Doug, you must be thinking about somewhere else. Uh, oh, with Boston. Well, yeah. sure. Don't you, have Bo don't you have a date with the Boston Marathon? Well, probably so. Did Boston this past year, Catherine. Uh, uh, I have to admit, I didn't qualify. got in on a sponsor's exemption. Uh, the old bones wouldn't go 315. <laughs> But uh, that was, without a doubt, the, the experience of my running life. It was a perfect day. Uh, my wife and I, Cindy, ran the first 16 miles together. We separated at Heartbreak of the series, you know, of Heartbreak Hills there. And uh, just had a wonderful time. I can't wait. Hopefully, if the Sitco people are accommodating, we'll be back there again this year. And just to participate and be out in that throng, the, the masses. We see the finish line here and the people who are here. Well, if you can multiply that by about 20, uh, just in this stretch, I mean, you have people all over the place. They say up to half a million, I think I've read, uh, who are out along that 26-mile course from Hopkins and all the way to downtown. Yeah, it's just incredible. I'm going to New York next week for the New York City Marathon. And if you can imagine a million people watching a race of 25,000, 100,000 people would run the New York City Marathon. If they could, they have to choose them by lottery. Everybody in that race has a story. And it is such an emotional experience for the city of New York, that jaded, dreadful, impersonal city suddenly gets very personal and even the crime rate goes down on marathon day that's yep. been statistically proven and that is that great testimony to the humanism quality of the sport that's a that's a wonderful race as you said the participation has to be limited because i mean it, it, they take in upwards to twenty five thousand, i think somewhere in there now and it goes through all five boroughs of the city harlem at the 20 mile mark i mean you know there are many people who are somewhat intimidated by that fact but that might be one of the better supported stretches of the race when you go yeah. through that 20 mile point. But that's New York and this is Tulsa. Well, the end of the Tulsa run and maybe the beginning of a running career for some of these people on the screen here. Congratulations to all the participants. For Doug Welsh and Catherine Switzer, I'm John Walls. We'll be back in a moment. Where in the world can you find a way to empty out your garage by filling it up with people? In the world classifies, where you'll reach thousands of garage sale shoppers, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. Where in the world can you find out about cowboys and Indians, touchbacks and razorbacks, slams and rams, sooners and laters? Every day in the world's expanded sports section, because nothing covers more of your world than your world. No two feet are the same, and Runner's World doesn't just sell running shoes. The trained salespeople at Runner's World take the time to learn about your feet before recommending a running shoe. Every member of the staff at Runner's World is a runner. They know that choosing the right shoe for your feet will help you reach your running goals without injury. Runner's World stocks over 100 types of shoes for a variety of running styles and forms. Whether you're a pronator or a supinator, Runner's World has the shoe suited to your specific stride. If your feet just don't feel right when you're running, the experts at Runner's World can help you get to the source of the problem. Why leave the choice of the most important piece of running equipment to amateurs? Don't let the wrong running shoes stop you in your track. Whether you're running 5Ks or marathons, the experienced staff at Runner's World can help make you fast and keep you injury free. Runner's World, your personal resource for running shoes, is proud to be a sponsor of this year's Tulsa Run. The 17th Annual Tulsa Run has been brought to you by Runner's World and the Tulsa World. Stephen Niamu and Delilah Asiogo are men's and women's champions, respectively, but as far as I'm concerned, the other 8,000 folks, hey, you're all winners. And if you're thinking about it next year, the right foot comes first and the rest is easy. So long, everyone. Thanks for watching.